Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with you on this 5th of July. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your local weather information. You can do that easily by calling 1-800-472-0391. Finding us online at weather.gov slash Alaska. And when you can't find what you want, send me an email. I'll be happy to guide you in the right direction or at least help you find what you need. David.Snyder at NOAA.gov is a great way to find me there. As you well know, and we've talked about for several weeks now, and want to remind you in case this is the first time you've watched the show in a while, the Alaska Aviation Weather Unit webpage, for general aviation especially, is changing on Friday, July the 14th. It is going to be updated, and it has changed a lot already. You can view the old page and the new page at the same time, but on the 14th, it's going to switch over to only the new page. So there's going to be a lot to take in there, a lot to try out, a lot to bookmark once again. Because a lot of the bookmarks that you've been using for years and years and years are not going to work anymore and will land you back on the home page. So be ready. July 14th, Friday, it's going to happen. Uh, we want to make sure that you're getting what you need out of the page. We're taking your comments and your suggestions and rolling them into the newer page to make it work. And um, it has been a process, and we certainly appreciate your input and uh, it's very important to make sure that it works for what you need and where you're going, any time of the day or night, of course. nws.ar.awu.webauthors at noaa.gov is a great way to let us know exactly what you think. Be nice. We're trying as hard as we can. And we'll make sure we uh, address those concerns there. And uh, we've been hard at work since you probably last wrote. So make sure you check in on the page once again and let us know if something is not working because it needs to work and we want it to work for you. Here's a look at the fire danger now. Uh, conditions have been drying out across the lower and middle Yukon Valley. You can see higher or even extreme fire danger now, generally along and north of the upper Yukon, all the way out toward Kotzebue Sound region and into parts of the Seward Peninsula and the upper sections of Norton Sound. Also looking at higher fire danger across the coastal plain. Uh, north of the Brooks Range. So drier conditions there where we don't see elevated fire conditions uh, anywhere across south central or southwest right now because it's been wet, it's been damp, and it's certainly been cloudy. So a lot of the conditions needed to keep fire danger high just haven't been met. In fact, uh, they've certainly improved a lot just in the last week. That doesn't necessarily mean you're enjoying summer exactly as how you'd like to see it in South Central, but so it goes. It's Alaska. It's one or the other. Here's a look at the satellite picture, and you can see we have been socked in across South Central for a good part of today. And if you've ever heard the phrase dirty high or dirty ridge, this is what's going on. High pressure is in charge, but an inversion or a change in the temperature as you go up and down is locking in moisture at the lower level. So it's been really tough to scrub away the wealth of cloud cover. It's slowly happening. It'll probably happen a little bit more tomorrow. In the meantime, more clouds are on the way across the central and eastern Gulf. You can see low pressure is pulling them closer and closer to southeast, though southeast looks like you had a fairly decent day today. After some morning cloud cover, a lot of that kind of got scrubbed away this afternoon. Across the interior, uh, clouds are bubbling up once again across the upper Tanana Valley and the upper Yukon Valley. Some of those showers and thunderstorms, as you see generally north of Dawson and north and uh, west of Northway and south and west of Whitehorse. Across the, uh, the west and the southwestern sections of Alaska, clouds have been bubbling up a little bit, but not so much in that big convective way right now. And as we look with the infrared satellite picture, you can see in the north coast, looking at a wealth of cloud cover there. A lot of that streaming northward through the eastern Aleutians, across the west coast, through Constable Sound and the Seward Peninsula, and further north there. That is coming with a wealth of wind, and warmth and humidity. So temperatures are fairly mild. This is also working to chew up more and more of the ice around Point Barrow through the Chukchi Sea and over the Beaufort Sea as well. A look out even further west shows that there is a circulation west of St. Paul. This area of low pressure is gradually drifting northward. There's another wave behind that that will reinforce that southerly flow across the central and eastern Bering Sea. Looks like we'll have gales up across most of the Chukchi Sea and generally north of St. Lawrence Island tonight and well into Thursday there. So uh, the water is open, but the water, of course, is choppy up in the Chukchi Sea. 
Today's weather shows that low pressure system west of the Priblovs at 998 millibars there. A, a lot of uh, warm uh, and you know wet winds coming up through the uh, Dutch Harbor area, up through Nunavak Island, uh, the St. Lawrence Island region through the Bering Strait and up to Point Barrow. You can see it's all rain there. Low pressure is working eastward. That's down to 1,014 millibars uh, north of the Canadian coastline in the Arctic. Showers and thunderstorms out ahead of that. High pressure is trying to set up across the southwest. Look like a few stations might re have been reporting some light rainfall earlier today. Very hit and miss with that. And high pressures across the northern Gulf, which brought a very nice day to southeast, but has been locking in a lot of the clouds across south central again. So a really pesky cloud cover that just doesn't want to go away. Tonight, don't be surprised to find a few showers across the Talkeetnas and eastward into the Wrangell St. Elias region. Most of southeast looks to be pretty dry. Low pressure across the Gulf moves northward ever so slightly and will gradually bring clouds back into southeast. Out across the central and eastern bearing, low pressure is pulling warm air along with it. But remember, high pressure is still in charge, and that includes everything out across Bristol Bay. So while conditions may be fairly calm, winds will be light and variable across the north and western Gulf Coast and Bristol Bay. There could be some fog along with that as well. Just to the west of that stable region, we get back into that southerly flow. That's going to keep fog and some light rain, or maybe even just drizzle outside of Norton Sound up to Cotsview Sound, where showers might be found across the Noatak and Kobuk Valleys and across the eastern Beaufort Sea Coast. A few showers and storms may remain there. A little bit further west, a 993 millibar low will be found from Kiska to Attu. Uh, this is gradually moving eastward. That will reinforce those southerly winds as we get back into Thursday for the west coast, but you'll notice it won't be a smooth process. There might be some uh, interruptions in the precipitation here and some areas of fog that form as waves of weather pass through. Thursday looks like a slightly better chance for a few more showers and storms, uh, perhaps as far south as uh, the hills closer to Anchorage, the Matanuska and Susitna Valley included, and generally north and east into the upper Tanana. Doesn't look to be terribly widespread, but a few clouds could be bubbling up as they have been today. High pressure across the western sections of Canada will still work to keep things generally dry across a large part of southeast, but showers will be encroaching across the uh, Gulf Coast there. Low pressure moves into the uh, Gulf's center at 1,008 millibars and the low in the west, holding at 993 millibars. A keen eye will catch this cold front moving across the northern coast of Russia that is moving to the south and east. We'll see how far south it gets. The cold air behind it is certainly cold and would uh, present a, a decent interruption in the warmer weather pattern we have across the northwest coast. But it looks like at this time it's more moving southward than it is eastward. So that should limit at least some of that advance uh, to keeping it away from uh, the west and northwestern coast of Alaska at this time. So low pressure out across the western Aleutians will be the favorite at 992 millibars. It brings a front into uh, the waters closer to St. Matthew, still uh, fairly near uh, the Priblops, St. Paul and St. George, and moving through Dutch Harbor and Alaska. This would be Friday afternoon. Low pressures across the central Gulf. Notice all that warm air that it brought in and the wet air has really found its way over into southeastern Alaska while the bulk of the circulation is starting to fill in and fall apart. There's still a chance for some showers and storms across the Alaska Range and uh, into the Deltana and Tanana Flats region, the middle Tanana Valley as well. With low pressure sitting across the Brooks Range, it will limit some of that development a little bit to the south, but that warm and wet air sneaking up across the west coast is also trying to work its way into the coastal plain. And with that, some showers should be found around Barrow and southward uh, into uh, well, maybe as far east and south as Colville and then westward toward the Kobuk and Noatak valleys there. So a lot going on. We'll keep our eye on that cold air up north. Summer's not over just yet, but in the meantime, summertime temperatures were back in southeast, upper 50s all the way around Petersburg and Wrangell northward toward the capital city where temps were even warmer in the mid 60s there, lower 60s for Skagway and Haines, 61 in Sitka, Ketchikan and Annette, uh, Metlakala. All fairly mild today. Hyder made it up to 72. Cordova was 59. Valdez mid-afternoon, 57 degrees, mid-60s down to Cook Inlet. Everyone heading out to catch the fish lately, enjoying some more summer-like temperatures there. 75 around Golcana. It was in the 70s and 80s as you head up the Richardson Highway toward the middle Tanana Valley. 76 in Fairbanks, 75 in Healy, 74 for Fort Greeley, 75 in Eagle, and up around uh, oh, Fort Yukon of 75 degrees today. Arctic Village, 70. Anaktuvik Pass going up and over at 60. 66 degrees and back in the 50s for the North Slope there. Uh, mid to upper 50s for many along the coastal areas. Kaktovik 51, one of the cooler spots as well as Barrow. Once you get inland, those temperatures jumped very quickly. As you get down toward Wainwright, 55. About the same around Kivalina, Kotzebue even warmer at 60. 55 for our friends in Shishmaref and 51 in Nome. 40s hung on there in St. Lawrence Island, Gamble and Savunga. 73 
around McGrath. It was 70 in Galena, 67 around Bethel. Uh, coastal areas uh, out toward Cape Newenham, a little bit on the milder side with Dillingham and King Salmon, both in the 50s and 60s. Lake Iliamna, 58 degrees. Mid to upper 50s for the Alaska Peninsula. The Pribilovs just shy of 50 today, but over 50 for Atka, 50 degrees for Adak, and 45 out on Attu. Overnight low temperatures will hold in the mid to upper 50s, some places fairly close to 60 degrees, but it doesn't look like anyone's going to make that tonight. Lower 50s for most of South Central, the Copper River Basin just a little bit cooler, southeast in the lower 50s. Overnight lows up north in the 40s uh, for many around Barrow and eastward, close to 50 degrees for Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse. Upper 40s to low 50s for the YK Delta, 50 in Nome, and 40s for the Aleutian Chain and the Alaska Peninsula with high temperatures tomorrow back in the upper 50s and lower 60s. Bristol Bay nearing 70 degrees, 73 for Bethel, 53 in Nome, 58 in Barrow. Uh, the middle Tanana Valley in the lower 80s. Slow roast there for sure for Eagle out toward Northway and westward toward Tanana with some of the warmest weather in the state. Uh, mid to upper 60s and low 70s for South Central. The Matanuska and Susitna Valleys will be some of the warmest there. And upper 60s and low 70s for most of Southeast with Haines and Skagway also enjoying a warm afternoon. Now, flying weather shows IFR conditions from St. Lawrence Island all the way down to the Aleutians and the Pribilovs tomorrow on the northern coast. Flirting with IFR in the morning and southeast looking fairly clear. Uh, MVFR conditions in parts of the Cook Inlet region near Kodiak and also inside of Prince William Sound. But you should see some improvements there in the afternoon uh, that may be questionable for improvements there in uh, Kodiak Southeast looking pretty good in the afternoon. IFR conditions for the Pribilovs, St. Lawrence Island, and the northern edge of the Yukon Delta region. So keep an eye on that. Here's a look at your pass conditions. Anaktuvik Pass and Attigan Pass look pretty good tomorrow. Uh, things should be pretty clear through most of the interior. Watching for convection in the afternoon for Lake Clark and Merrill Pass all the way through Rainy Pass and Windy Pass. VFR, but towers uh, will probably be building in the afternoon. Isabel Pass looking at VFR conditions there. Same goes for Mentasta Pass for your Thursday. Tanita Pass, we expect to see showers and storms developing in the region in the afternoon, otherwise VFR. Portage Pass and VFR over the sound, but the pass itself looks to be pretty good. And Chilcoot and White Pass, as you saw there, things look pretty much okay during the morning and the afternoon. Freezing levels, a lot of warm air is sitting out across the state here. Levels as high as 12,000 feet for the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta. South and west of the Pribilovs, it gets even warmer, 12 to 14,000 feet. And we still have our cold pool of air out across the Gulf with levels there at 6 to 8,000 feet. The moisture, though, is really focused out across the west. And you can see those levels uh, to reach into the light to isolated moderate range have to be above 10,000 feet, so most of you will be just fine tomorrow. Uh, watch for convection, though, again, around the Susitna, the Matanuska Valleys, all the way up into the upper Tanana Valley, and maybe as far south as the Kenai Peninsula there, so we'll keep an eye on that. Of course, that implies uh, isolated areas of extreme icing, so just be careful. Uh, tomorrow's jet stream has our low pressure system stacked and packed right over the Gulf. It, it's not a very hefty low at the surface, but aloft, it's just enough to keep that cool pool of air and that moisture circula circulating around. A ridge of high pressure across the west coast is limiting the advance of that colder air we saw on the surface charts there for Friday. So right now, as long as that high's there, that low is going to have to stay there. Well, that's okay with us. Low pressure south of the Kamchatka Peninsula is spinning up some faster moving winds. This will be interesting because it's guiding in that warm and wet kind of subtropical feed from some tropical weather out across western Pacific regions closer to Japan. And then one of those is a tropical storm. Not expecting the storm, but we're certainly getting a taste of the warm and wet air. At 9,000 feet, you can see that broad south and westerly flow across the YK Delta, across the Brooks Range. Uh, levels there anywhere from 25 to 40 knots or so with the southeasterly flow across the eastern Gulf, 15 to 30 knots. Low pressures right there over the Gulf as we've seen it so many times now and low pressure out across the western chain guiding in some faster moving winds again, all feeding into that warm and wet air. We've got a south and westerly flow across the west coast, also at 3,000 feet. High pressure is a little bit more entrenched here across the western Alaska range, and uh, it's pushing air away from it at 10 to 20 knots. And we're still looking at some stronger winds across the coastal plain there as well. And the north slope uh, winds could peak as high as 50 knots tomorrow at 3,000 feet. We've got a south and easterly wind across southeastern Alaska, 10 to 20 knots there. And across most of south central, winds will be fairly light, somewhat variable, 10 to 15 knots in most regions. Turbulence potential is going to focus on the west coast, the, well, most of the Yukon Delta, Norton Sound, Seward Peninsula, Kotzebue Sound, and Kobuk and Noatak region in the western uh, parts of the Brooks Range. Below 3,000 feet during most of the day, you're going to see some chop in that region. It doesn't look to reach uh, occasional moderate levels, but it'll be noticeable. Below 3,000 feet, 
Uh, the central and eastern Aleutians, maybe to the uh, as far east as Sand Point tomorrow, also below 3,000 feet, and watching for convection in south central and the upper Tanana Valley. That's a look at your aviation forecast. We'll be back with the rest of your marine weather and a sea ice update in just a few minutes. The Casitsa Bay Laboratory, which is operated by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the University of Alaska Fairbanks, is a unique marine research and teaching laboratory that is dedicated to excellence in marine science. The laboratory is currently involved in several research projects. One of those projects is called Hydropalooza, which has received a lot of attention on both a local and national level. Here to talk about this important project are the directors of the laboratory, Chris Holderied and David Christie. Welcome to the studio, guys. Thanks, Thank Jim. you. What is Hydropalooza, Chris? Well, Hydropalooza fundamentally is a two-year seafloor coastline mapping project for Kachemak Bay. And it's providing high resolution, high spatial resolution, very detailed maps of both the sea bottom and the coastline to support a whole variety of different purposes. Um, it, it basically will tell us the shape of the bay and the coast as well as what's on the bottom. Um, but more than just mapping, it's really working with a whole variety of partners both within the state and outside the state on how do we, NOAA, get more information, better benefits about all this data that we collect primarily for navigation purposes. We do it to uh, make nautical charts and to ensure safe navigation, but it can also be used for resource management, for local development, um, and for emergency response. Why is this being done in Alaska? Well, it's, it's an interesting question because um, primarily that they're within Kachemak Bay, it was a natural place to do this because we have both the NOAA Kasitsna Bay Laboratory and the Kachemak Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. So we've got kind of the um, built-in partnerships and collaborations to make this work well. Um, but also 40% of NOAA's uh, mapping effort nationwide is actually done in Alaska. So it's a natural place to do this. Oh, wow, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what collaborations support this project? Well, this is one of these projects that can't be done without a lot of partners. Um, from the national perspective, we've got two NOAA ships coming in, the NOAA ship Fairweather and the NOAA ship Rainier um, came in last summer in 2008 and they'll be coming back in 2009. Uh, NOAA Cessna Citation Aircraft is doing the shoreline mapping um, and we're working with many offices within our Office of Coast Survey and National Geodetic Service as well as the uh, Coastal Ocean Science part of the National Ocean Service. Um, within the state, we're working with Alaska Department of Fish and Game, as well as the Kachemak Bay Research Reserve um, and Department of Natural Resources, other state organizations that would be interested in, in this kind of information. Mm -hmm. And then locally, we're doing a lot with local marine conservation and education groups. So who benefits from Hydropalooza? In a general way, everybody who lives or works and plays on or around the bay benefits. Um, at a management level, coastal planners can use the information to do a much better job of what they have to do. People who manage fisheries or manage marine navigation will benefit from having more accurate maps. And people who fish for subsistence, for sport or commercially will also benefit from having a better maps to work from. From a scientific level, the mapping is just the start. It tells us the shape of the bay, so already we understand much more about the details of how the bay is constructed, and that enables us to go on, understand how the tides and currents work better on, on more detail, and then how those things affect um, plankton, crab larvae, things like that moving through the bay, how they affect the fresh water that floods into the bay from the glaciers at certain times of the year, and how sediments are redistributed around the bay. Can you describe some of the early findings from the Hydropalooza research? Yeah, well, the, the um, new mapping systems uh, give us a much more high-definition image than we've ever had before, so we can actually, even from the very earliest maps, we can start to see some things on the seafloor. Some of the more exciting things we've seen is right off the end of Homer Spit, there's a landslide. We don't know yet whether this is a was formed during the 1964 earthquake or whether it's an active feature, but that's certainly something that we'll be wanting to look at very soon. Another interesting feature, there was a wreck discovered off the Homer Spit that I was not well known before. Probably fishermen knew it was there, but we didn't. And um, another very interesting feature up near the head of the bay, there's an area in which there are 
some interesting circular structures. And these are things we call pockmarks. And the most likely thing these are is a place where something is coming out onto the seafloor. It could be groundwater, or even more interesting, it could be methane that's derived from the coal beds in the region. So methane is very interesting because if that's the case, it will be su potentially supporting some very interesting life forms around with these vents. So that's another area of interest that we'll be getting into. But this has got to be so exciting for both of you. I mean, when you're seeing these things revealed to you for the first time, I mean, what's your initial reaction when you see a, a shipwreck and you see, you know, these uh, different terrain features that you've never even thought were there? Well, one of the really fun things that happens is when we have, when we put these maps out for um, public outreach mm -hmm. events and things like that, and it's amazing to see who hones in mm -hmm. on what. So the fishermen will hone in on where they see potential fishing areas in the detail. Mm -hmm. um, the kids honed in on things like the, the wreck, and we had uh, found a 150-foot high bedrock feature um, that hadn't been known about before. So this 150-foot you know, huge rock or whatever it is, we don't know yet. Um, you know, they jumped right on things like that. So it's exciting. Geologists see one part, you know, fisheries managers see something else. It's yeah. information that everyone can use. So Chris, what happens next? Well, we finished up the 2008 field work and from last summer, and we'll be starting the planning uh, for the 2009 field season. So both the two ships, Fairweather and Rainier, will be coming back, as well as NOAA aircraft um, in August of 2009. Concurrently, we're processing the data from the uh, first field season, and so the shoreline mapping data is already available through online through the NOAA Coastal Services Center, um, and the bathymetry data, the, the seafloor bottom data, will be available soon. But one of the things this will also serve as is a model for how NOAA does these kind of projects nationwide. It's called Integrated Ocean and Coastal Mapping, um, and the basic principle is we map once, but we use the information many times for many different benefits. So we'll be um, providing information on uh, that kind of process too. Great, that's wonderful. Thank you guys for coming into the studio today and talking about this wonderful project, Hydropalooza. Thanks for giving us the chance to talk about it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, thanks and so I much. I wish you the best. Thanks. And thank you for joining us here in Alaska Weather Facts. Until next time. Here's a look at today's sea ice edge. Not a whole lot of change from what we were talking about yesterday. You'll notice there's still some slightly thicker ice concentrations between Wainwright and Barrow over the next couple days with the warmer winds. This would be likely an area that we'll see some quick changes in. There's also some more open water uh, developing east of Dead Horse to Kaktovik and northward. So again, a lot of changes there with warmer air still in place. Expect even more. Weather.gov slash Anchorage slash ice is a place to go for this type of information. Looking at southeast, winds are fairly light for your Thursday. We have a southerly flow in the Northern Canal. That's 10 knots with a two-foot sea. And you'll find similar conditions elsewhere through the inner channel. Southerly winds up towards Sitka from the Dixon entrance, 10 to 15, with five-foot seas there and light northerly winds as you head into the northern Gulf. As we get into Friday, you'll start to see a little bit more of a southwesterly push. Winds are still fairly light and seas are still fairly small. Five-foot seas are creeping northward toward Cross Sound and uh, up toward Gustavus. But the low-pressure system that's driving this is still well away, and you know, you'll see more clouds than any big changes out at sea. As we get into Thursday in South Central, light and variable winds rule the roost. For inside and outside of Prince William Sound, conditions look favorable for fishing. Same goes for Cook Inlet and around Kodiak Island. The conditions shouldn't be a whole lot better. The only thing to make it better, maybe a little bit more sun. As we get into Friday, winds start to pick up a little bit more on either side of Kodiak Island. You have a northeast wind, 15 to 20 with 5-foot seas expected. There are north and easterly flow across the northern gulf and northeasterlies inside of Prince William Sound. Still light and 2-foot seas there. As we look at uh, Bristol Bay, look for a light southeasterly wind, 10 knots and 2-foot seas, but just down the coast, southeasterlies pick up to about 20 to 25 with small craft advisories uh, in the region. 5 to 6-foot seas are expected, light and variable winds from Castle Cape to Chignik. Not a big change there on Friday. Seas come up to 4 feet. Winds and seas stay light and small as you get into Bristol Bay, and southeasterlies continue down the coast along the Alaska Peninsula with 5 to 6-foot seas and winds 20 to 25. For the Aleutians, an east and southeasterly flow continues west of ADAC. That's where we'll see some of the higher seas and winds, 25 knots or so there. We'll start to pick up a little bit more in the east as well, 25 to 30 with seas from 7 to 9 feet. And a southerly flow continues around the central chain, 15 to 20 in that region, with 4 to 7 foot seas on Thursday. A little bit more of a southwesterly push as we get into Friday, 20 to 25, 9 to 11 foot seas in the west, and 8 to 9 foot seas across the Pacific coast as winds begin to nudge in a little bit more from the south and west, remembering there's 
There's two waves of weather. One's working through now and another one's approaching as we get into Friday. And that southerly flow is reinforced for Nikolski to Unalaska, 20 to 30 knots. There are six to eight foot seas on Friday. For the West Coast, southerlies continue again, adding warm and wet air further and further north. 25 to 30 knots in most areas, 8 to 9 foot seas north of Nunavak Island, around St. Paul and St. George, 8 foot seas on a 25 knot wind, a little bit more of a southeasterly flow up the Kuskokwim Delta. And you'll see that again on Friday. Not much of a change there. South and easterly winds for most of the bearing. And St. Paul and St. George come up to 30 knots with a 10 foot sea to wrap up the week. As we look at the north slope, look for a broad southerly flow even over the ice there, 5 to 8, even 10 foot seas down toward Point Hope with winds up to 35 knots. So watch for a kind of a stiff, warm and southerly flow as we get through your Thursdays. We get into Friday, a little bit more of a westerly flow over the Beaufort Sea Coast, four foot seas between Dead Horse and Kaktovik. Southwesterly is coming up from Cape Lisburn, Point Lay, uh, toward Wainwright and Barrow, five to seven foot seas there and outside of Kotzebue Sound. Uh, southerly flow, 25 knots with a five foot sea for your Friday. That's a look at your marine weather. Let's recap what we talked about on the surface charts. That southerly wind is making its way all the way up through the Bering Strait and along the west coast and the Chukchi Sea coast. Periods of rain and uh, showers will be likely in that area. It won't be wall to wall wet weather, but in this region you'll have the chance of getting wet. Showers and thunderstorms are possible this evening moving away from the Brooks Range and into the northern sections of the Yukon. Watch for some showers around south central. Southeast looks pretty dry and with a frontal boundary working into the north and eastern Gulf. Expect more clouds, especially along the outer coast there, but this is filling in and trying to go away. And across the west, the next weather disturbance there will improve and increase that southerly flow. And you'll see that uh, picking up a little bit more as we head into Friday. Notice that cold front again out across uh, eastern Russia. That is moving a little bit more south than east, so not a huge concern just yet. As we get into Friday afternoon, widely scattered showers and thunderstorms around the Alaska Range and northward into the interior. Thanks for watching Alaska Weather. See you tomorrow. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service.